good evening, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is Lydia Paradiso, and this is the November installment of our uh, monthly Tory Talk series. Um, <clears throat> before we go into uh, our talk for tonight, I wanted to just give you a little bit of background about the society and some other things that we have going on. Um, so the Tory Botanical Society is the oldest botanical society in the Western Hemisphere. We were founded in 1867. Uh, the main goal of the society is to um, promote knowledge uh, of all topics of botany uh, and fungi, because also, of course, when this is back when the society was first started, uh, fungi were uh, considered plants. We um, have several different activities. Uh, we host uh, these lectures, which are were in person, but now have been virtual for the last um, few years. We also host a series of field trips throughout the year. We actually have a field trip coming up uh, this Sunday, which is a lichen trip uh, at the Woodlawn Cemetery. If you are interested in attending this trip, uh, I will put a link to our website where you can find out more information and you can sign up there. Let me find my chat, I wasn't ready, here we go. We also have, uh, are active on Twitter and Facebook. So if you are active on those sites, you can also uh, follow us on either of those to get updates on any future walks that we're doing, any talks that we're doing or any other kind of events. Uh, we also have a um, series of student and early career fellowships that the, the um, applications are currently open. The deadline for those is January 1st. We have um, awards for undergraduates, master's students, PhD students, um, and some awards for um, attending symposia or um, different training programs. So you can also find out about that on our website. So tonight we have for you um, Joao Araujo, who is the uh, assistant mycology curator at the New Botanical Garden. Um, and he is going to speak to us about the zombie ant fungus, which was the focus of his doctoral thesis and continues to be part of the work that he does. So I'll hand it over to him. Thank you, Lydia, for the introduction. Let me just share the screen. I think it's, can you see the screen? Yes. All right. So thank you very much for everybody that came tonight to watch the talk. And I apologize for those that already watched this talk. So I'm about to reformulate uh, a new talk and start another one. But um, I hope you enjoy, even if you're watching that for a second time. So as, as Lydia uh, introduced me, so I'm an assistant curator in mycology at the New York Botanical Garden. And my research is, is focused on entomopathogenic fungi. So, and well, actually insect-associated fungi, because now I also interested in the endosymbionts that I will be talking about. But it is mostly a talk about the zombie and fungi and, and to show how diverse they are and the strategies they use to uh, spread the spores and so on. So thank you very much for coming. So the kingdom fungi is currently comprised by about 135,000 uh, species described, but the estimations range from 600,000 and up to 10 million species predicted to be described. And most of the, the di diversity, uh, fungal diversity we know, are comprised by the knowledge uh, through mycological associations and the broad interest of scientists and the public on mushroom forming uh, species and the saprophytes that we commonly find in the forest where they're edible, some of them, so many people are very interested. So we know them re they relatively well, especially here in US compared to Brazil that it's not so culturally explored like it is in US. So we know relatively well, but it's still very little about the decomposers. And we know also about the mycorrhizal associations between fungi and plant roots, that's beneficial to the plants. And we know also a bit on the lichens diversity because they are uh, good model systems to understand in those uh, symbiosis between organisms. And also they are uh, indicator or for air quality. And of course, the plant pathogens, we know them relatively better than all these other ones because they are um, economically very important because they cause uh, massive losses in, on 
crop reduction in agriculture. So there's some quite a lot of research done on these fungi. But what about the diversity of fungi associated with insects? So that's, uh, I, I, I usually joke with that saying that this is the dark side of mycology because there are so uh, very uh, few people work on this, on this group. And we know so little that when I go to, to tropical forests, so I, most of the collections I would say are composed by, by new species. So it's amazing how many new species there are to be still described and we know so little about them yet. So it's, it's a really interesting and fascinating uh, group of fungi, but we know little about them. So now I'll be talking about the major lineages of entomopathogenic fungi, like an overall. And I'll start with the Basidiomycota, the, which include the mushroom forming uh, fungi, mushroom, and the wood decaying fungi. But in, as entomopathogenic fungi, only two lineages arose. One is Fibula rhizoctonia on the left, that are these uh, orange spheres that mimics the, the egg of termites that was um, explored by uh, Matsura in Japan. He published a series of papers that are very interesting. And he has shown that the, the fungal sclerotia, these uh, spheres, the orange spheres, they mimic the egg of termites. So when these termites uh, find these sclerotia in the forest, they sometimes bring them to the nest, as we can see here, the, among the eggs, the white um, eggs. And they mimic them in the, as the diameter, the texture, and perhaps even uh, pheromones are being released. So they, the, the termites understand those sclerotia as um, uh, their own eggs. And this fungal sclerotia, they can switch from saprophytic to entomopathogenic stage and then consume the eggs eventually. And on the left, on the right is the Theptobasidium. It's a very interesting figure because that's a cross section showing the, the, the bottom half, the, the tree bark being uh, uh, cut. And then we have the scale insect in the middle and then the fungal uh, crust on, up, on, on top of the insect, which these fungi actually, they use the insect as a gateway into the plant. So the fungi is, it grows much, much larger than their, their host. So meaning that they're getting nutrients from the plant. And then they use the, the, the scale insects. Sometimes they, most, most of the times they don't kill this insect in this case, but they penetrate hyphae in the insect so they can uh, reach the hemocell cell uh, of the, the insect and then get the nutrients the insects penetrating, uh, they're uh, absorbing and sucking from the, the plants, the sap. So that's those two lineages of uh, entomopathogenic fungi that uh, are present in basidiomycetes, which is very, very diverse. So it's very surprising that only these two lineages are present. Another case is more um, a basal lineage, blastocladiomycota. So in this case, the, the fungi is aquatic, so they form uh, zoospores and they, they infect two different hosts, a copepod, and they also infect the mosquito larvae. So they can infect the copepod and kill the copepod and then uh, as they kill the copper pod, it breaks, and then these flagellated cells uh, will swim, and then they fuse, the male and female, or the plus and minus, the different mating types, they will fuse, and then they will infect the mosquito. So it can either kill the mosquito and then come back to the, the copper pod and then to the mosquito larva again, or they can remain the mosquito, uh, the mosquito larva body, and then when the, the, the mosquito reach the adult stage, they will lay uh, fungal uh, sporangia and not their own eggs. So that's a good strategy because it ensures that the mosquito, that, that the fungus is being released in the breeding site of the mosquito, ensuring that it is finding suitable hosts to, to infect. And then on the right side, you can see the real uh, photograph of how it, these fungal cells looks like inside the mosquito larvae. Another interesting group is Entomophthora mycota, which is quite a, a long and strange name. So, but this is super diverse group as well. So it's, it's comparable to the Hippocrealian fungi in, in diversity, but uh, they're not as common as Hippocrealian fungi in, in the tropics. And when the, the for example, this one, uh, Erinia, so this fungi, when they infect the insect, they uh, fill the insect with the, the fungal mass. And as they grow and develop inside the, the, the beetle, 
the beetle will spread the wings because of the pressure inside. So that's a display for, for the, the, during the mating season. So that would, as we can see in the, in the drawing on the right side, they can attract other mosquitoes, or other beetles. And then when this beetle touch the other one trying to mate, will get in contact with the spores and get infected. And that's uh, similar to the zombie ants because they also cause the behavior manipulation. We see that both beetles are exactly the same way. And if we look closely, we'd see that they are biting onto the plant. So that means that the behavior manipulation evolved multiple times in the evolution of, of fungi. So once in the Entomophthora mycota, and then again, multiple times in Ophiocordyceps, as I will show later. And still in the Entomophthora mycota, those are uh, very interesting groups, uh, Massospora and Strong Welsi, because they are two of the very few lineages of entomopathogens <clears throat> that can uh, shoot spores from the living, living host. So the Cordyceps, for example, and, and all the other entomopathogens, they have to kill the host in order to produce the fruiting bodies and, and to sporulate. But in this case, they sporulate from the living body of the host. So as the host walk around and fly, it will disperse the spores as they, they, they live. So this is a good strategy for the, the fungi as well. And now we're going to uh, narrow down to the Ascomycota or, or Ascomycetes and the Hippocrealian fungi, which is the order comprising the, 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 the most of the, the diverse of entomopathogens we have. So just stepping back to understand how they evolve. So back in the Cretaceous, around 150 million years ago, there was the radiation of the angiosperms. So all these plants were evolving back in the Cretaceous and radiating and all these different types of flowers, different types of plants were creating uh, new niches for the, the insects to, to exploit. So the insects co-evolved with the plants. So the plants radiated and then the insects also radiated in order to exploit these new niches that were being uh, created. And yes, I just mentioned that was the radiation of insects follow that. And then we can, we can think about that parsimonials to think a uh, three layer of uh, coevolution. So we have the radiation of angiosperms and the radiation of insects, mostly through their different types of mouth parts. So they evolve very different types of mouth parts to exploit plants in different ways. Like the bees uh, suck the pollen, uh, leak the pollen and carry the pollen to back to their, 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 their nests. While the leaf hoppers, they, they have a stylet that will uh, suck the sap out of the plant and so on. So all these different plants were evolving and all these different mouth parts of insects and insect lineages were co-evolving with the plants. So if we compare the phylogeny of the plants, the phylogeny of the insects, and then we add the phylogeny of uh, the cordyceps-like fungi, cochrealian entomopathogenic fungi, we see that they most likely co-evolve together as we see in this uh, green bars that has been popping in, into these phylogenies. So that's the Cretaceous. And we see that there's a lot of diversification and nodes present there. So they likely co-evolved in, in this way in the three different layers. So that's a, a slide showing the evolution of Hippocrealian fungi. So the, we can start here on the A1, on the, on the circle on the right, right side. That's the beginning of the tree. And these branches were color coded according to the host association. So dark green means um, plant-based nutrition and pink means a mycoparasite. And for example, blue means coleoptera and red means uh, hymenoptera ants, for example. So there's a, a, a legend on the, the bottom left. So but the message here is that the, the, the order was retraced according to our data and, and previous studies that the origin of procreolian fungi was likely uh, associated with plant as an endophyte or a plant saprophyte or a plant parasite. We don't know, we didn't do this uh, type of detail, detailed uh, analysis yet, but we can, we can be pretty uh, confident to propose the hypothesis that the origins of procreolian fungi was through the, an ancestor associated with plants. And then as the evolution took place, these uh, host associations uh, uh, were 
uh, intimately being created. And also there was a whole switch from plants to fungi and from plants to insect and from fungi to insect and so on. There, there was lots of uh, host shifts or host jumps along the evolution of Procrealian fungi. And they, these three here also shows the three main families of entomopathogen in Procrealian fungi. Uh, Cordyceptaceae, Claviceptaceae, and Ophiocordyceptaceae. And they evolved completely different ways. So the, the, the common ancestral of each of these families were different uh, according to, to our data. And I will show in more detail, I will pop these uh, different families up so we can see it more closely how they evolved. So this was all these phylogenetic trees were reconstructed and were coded based on the host association. So the branch colors means the host association. For this figure, so the pink means association with fungi, mycoparasites, and the purple means association with uh, spiders, and then yellow means association with Lepidoptera. So that's those are the main host groups uh, shown here. So the basal lineages of uh, Cordyceptaceae were would be have been associated as with other fungi as mycoparasites, and then they jumped to the spiders with uh, Evansa and Gibelula, and then they jumped to the insect. We see these dashed lines because we didn't have the resolution to, to state which those uh, host orders were, but definitely insects, but we don't know what, what order. That's why it's still dashed. We hope to, as we describe more species, we get a better understanding and these nodes start to get uh, more resolved. But we see that the uh, Cordyceptaceae, this family here, it was originated through a mycoparasite. And then if we compare with Claviceptaceae, that's a scale insect, a very strange looking insect. So they're a sessile and they remain stuck the sap from the, the plant for their entire life. So they don't even move. Once they are settled, they will be there forever. And so the, the, according to our analysis, the ancestral host was a scale insect. And from scale insects, they jumped to other uh, host groups, for example, the dashed lines to the insects, and then created the uh, originated metarhizium, the quite uh, well known uh, fungi among these, these other genera because they have been used as biocontrol agents for, for pests, although they are generalist fungi. So I, I think there might be other better co evolved fungi to help with uh, to fight crop pests and these things. But metarhizium in Bavaria has been the, the, the broadly studied on, on uh, biocontrol aspects. And then we see, I don't know if you can see my, 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 my arrow here, but this uh, light, light green here is a hemiptera association. And then they jump here to plants and the dark green means plant. Light green hemiptera scale insects and then uh, dark green plants. So we, we had the or origin of the, the order as plant associated, then they jump to other groups. And then now here, they came back from scale insects back to the plants, their, their most ancestral ecology. And then we see that other host jumps to place back again. And then here, and even here, we have the verticillium and tyrannicordyceps infecting other fungi, mycoparasites, with, which uh, interestingly, these uh, tyrannicordyceps, for example, infects claviceps purpurea which is uh, close related to, to themselves. So they're, the parasite and the host are very closely related uh, along the evolution. And then we have the Ophiocordyceptaceae, which is the family that I have been studying uh, more uh, intensively. So and then we retraced their character, ancestral character. And then our data suggests a host association with pito larvae. And then we have uh, uh, other jumps to other clades. Yellow means Lepidoptera, butterflies and moths. And here prominently, we can see two clades uh, associated with ants. We have the ant picture in front, but the, it means the, the red branches. So that's, those are the, the two different clades infecting ants. We can see one infecting uh, mostly Camponotus or, or um, carpenter ants, and the one at the bottom in fact, in fact mostly uh, ponerine ants, which are completely different uh, ants. Ponerines are large and includes the bullet ants. 
and they they hunt rather than uh, scavenging things like the Camponotus. So there are ecologically very different groups of holes. And so we I just have shown that these three families that correspond the, the majority of species of entomopathogens that they evolve in different ways. So the origin of one of them were mycoparasites while the other one was a scale insect uh, ancestral. And then here in Ophicoris ectasia, a beetle larvae ancestral was the, the oldest lineage that we could retrace. So they're very different, although they are closely related, they are very different uh, evolutionarily speaking and morphologically speaking, ecologically. So they are completely different uh, families. And Ophicoriceps is, is particularly interesting because of the endosymbionts I will be talking later. So, and among the Hippocrylian fungi, we have also medically important lineages. One is Tolipocladium flatum, which was the, the first fungi that um, the cyclosporin was uh, isolated which is nowadays used against uh, organ rejection. So when you go through a organ transplant, you take cyclosporin to help your body to accept this new organ and don't reject it. So that was originally um, isolated from uh, tolipocalin and flatum. I believe nowadays they do, it, uh, they synthesize that in the lab and don't extract them from the fungi anymore, but I'm, I'm not sure. And we have Ophiocordyceps sinensis, of course, it's very famous and is the Himalayan gold, some people say, and they, they worth a lot of money. We can see here $160 each. So it's, it's quite expensive. And it's leading these fungi to extinction because over harvesting, especially in the Bhutan, where they are um, commonly found in the, the Bhutanese plateau, then exported to China and everywhere else. So now people are growing them in the lab, but apparently they're not as, as medically uh, valuable as the the wild ones, I don't I don't know. So there are some studies on, on this showing that that kind of results very interesting. That the host uh, makes a difference on the the content of cordycepine and, and and so on. But that's another 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 uh, subject. Anyway, so we have also magically important fungi among these entomopathogens. And now finally we're narrowing to the the zombie and fungi. So they are comprised by over 50 species now described. And they, they are very interesting, mostly because they are um, infecting a, a very commonly found insect, which is the ants, and because of the behavior manipulation. So they, they could be called zombie and fungi because they literally control the behavior of the host. So they're half alive, I would say, because they're, when they are infected. And well, of course, zombie ants, fungi infect ants, right? And ants is, is good. Well, good hosts or bad hosts is, is, is quite odd to mention, but they're good hosts for the fungi because they promote fungal biodiversity. They promote the speciation of fungi. I believe, and we, our, um, our data has been proved that to be correct, that the ants are, Ion, we can call them as ions, islands of biodiversity. So they are promoting fungal biodiversity by uh, enabling fungi to jump from one host to another, because in the forest, especially in the tropics, we see that in the same location, there are many dozens, sometimes hundreds of uh, species of ants living in the same relatively small area. So they are quite intimately associated with them and their niche overlap quite often. And they are very numerous. So that makes it easier to the fungi once it jumps from one host, for example, the beetle larvae to an ant, and then to jump to other ants in the same species because they are lived together in the high density colonies. And because they also have closely phylogenetically close related species around these species. So as the, the fungus jump to one species of ant to another, they're likely to, to uh, speciate and then a new fungal species would be, would be created or originated. And then when this lineage jump to another ant that live in the same location and species over uh, millions of years of evolution, that species of lineage of fungi tends to be uh, another uh, species of fungi. So that's easier to the fungi to jump to one ant to another and then uh, having such a uh, biodiversity we see in the forest, they're quite common. And the ants are also particularly interesting as uh, good model systems, 
because they are ecologically dominant. The phylogenetic relationships is well known. They're diverse in ecology, their behavior, their life history. They have uh, rich fossil records, which help us to calibrate phylogeny so we can understand how these fungi and their hosts co-evolved together. And they're most abundant animals on, in tropical forests. So they're quite, uh, quite common to find uh, zombie ants in tropical forests all over the globe. And for the, the, the aspect of studying the coevolution between parasites and their host, so this is interesting model system because the host remains identifiable after the fungal infections. So when the host is uh, killed by, by, by the fungi, for example, the beetle uh, larvae, so they are soft body and they get uh, often destroyed or taxonomic, the ta taxonomically informative uh, uh, features are usually destroyed. So we cannot identify the host uh, properly um, unless we do like a, 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 we use a forensic kit or something to extract DNA, usually a, a CO1 we use as a barcoding for the, the host. But in order to identify them quickly based on morphology, ants is great because as other groups of hard-bodied insects, the, the, their traits remain still identifiable after even sometimes months in the forest. So that's a, a good model systems in from many different perspectives. And this is um, a stereotype of uh, zombie ants because they climb up to a summit position and bite into the plant part. And then the fungus will fill the, the, the body of the, of the ant as yeast-like cells first. And then just before it dies, these yeast-like cells start to form a pseudomycelium and then form these chains that will, will uh, fill the, the whole body of the host. And when the host is killed, after very few hours, we have observed that even two hours after the host is killed, these chains of cells, the pseudohyphae, start to germinate and then become filamental fungi. And then they fill the whole body of the host. And then all these hyphae start to reorganize on the back of the head. And then these, uh, these pseudohyphae and these, these uh, chains of cells uh, most likely helps to uh, transport the nutrients that the fungus absorbing from the abdomen, for example, to the back of the head. And then depending on the species, but in the Brazilian Amazon, up to two weeks after the, the biting, they produce these uh, beautiful fruiting bodies that is composed by a sexual and asexual uh, states uh, often. And then that's a close, uh, close up of the, the fruiting body. And then if we do a cross section, in the, the fruiting body, we see these uh, chambers that are called periticium in the plural periticia. And then they, they shoot the spores into the environment so they can infect other uh, passing by ants. And then the next slide will be a, a two, three minute video showing uh, the behavior manipulation in place. And then the, the, there's a nice time lapse on showing the fungi growing, and at the end, you will see other different types of, of host groups being affected. Yeah, they're, they're not just restricted to the ants, as I, as I showed, and this is, uh, those are really beautiful examples, I guess. Um, Come back here. All right. So these slides shows to me the, the most important part of the work, which is going to the field and collecting the fungi ourselves and understanding the way they grow, understanding the way they shoot spores and which other species interact with them. So I think without going yourself to the forest, that's really really difficult to understand how this, this fungi live. Even going there is, is very difficult, I, I think. But I think going to the field is pretty crucial. And that's one of, uh, there are many people that are losing this interest, unfortunately, but I share that passion with many other colleagues. So that's one slide for that. And this also shows that we have to uh, process these fungi really quickly after we, we collect them because they're, usually tiny and delicate and other fungi can grow on top of them. If we uh, close them in a tube and leave it there for three days, for example, it will most likely other fungi will grow on them. And so it will be bad for DNA sequencing and for morphological observation. 
So we usually we have to make a makeshift lab. For example, on the bottom left here, we have a boat in the Amazon that we transformed in the makeshift lab or on the top right in the hotel room in Ghana. So we took a microscope there and we prepared everything still in the field because mounting them as they are fresh, it's also a, a, a different experience. Of course, we can get from uh, specimens from a herbarium and hydrate them and they will, will look beautiful. But when they are fresh, you can still observe the spores being shot and you can collect spores and then the spores will germinate in the petri dish and we can observe secondary uh, germinations, uh, secondary spores being germinate. And this is also taxonomically important. So, but it's only possible if you go to the field and collect the fresh specimen and do it there in the next couple of days after you collect them. And this is uh, part of the workflow for um, describing um, a new species. So we collect them in the situ, in situ, in, in, in the jungle, in the forest, or, and then we, I, I take macro photos of them. I have records for them. So this is an ant. We, we look at them large in our screen, but they're actually really small organisms. And then we bring them back to the lab. We do the molecular work. We extract DNA, the PCR, send for sequencing. And then we make these sections. We see that this plate in the center of the, of the screen, there is a, a one structure with the periticia. So we have to make a, a cross section in the fruiting body, the ascoma, that we can observe these uh, features and measure the, the features. And then we can compare with other species. Then if they are uh, different morphologically and also the molecular results also show that are different lineages, then we, we can uh, propose as a new species. But for me, for, uh, for my work, I usually use ecology, morphology, and molecular data to uh, propose new species. Sometimes it's more difficult because they're morphologically similar. For example, Bovaria species or Metarism. So you have to rely a lot on the, the molecular. But it's, it's not the case for most of the, of, of the species because we can like readily look at the species and, and, and mount their slides and then, wow, that's, that's a different species. They are usually quite, quite distinct. And these slides just paved the way for the next couple of slides that shows the importance of taxonomy, the taxonomic works that will, that's very useful to lay the foundation for every work we do in biology, which I, I believe. And so we see that in Quant in 2014, so of these uh, zombie and fungi were comprised just by a branch chain of the Cordyceps pulvinata, one in Japan, and then of the Cordyceps unilateralis, in a general, very general uh, uh, concept of that species, and sometimes of the Cordyceps sp, as we see here. But then I, I, I did, and others also did in, 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 for other groups, so we, we dedicated some years of our life, literally. And then we went to the forest, collected these uh, new species and we proposed them as new species. And now our understanding that used to be like these few branches vaguely uh, named. Now we have a much better understanding on the diversity of this group, the species boundaries and the taxonomic features we should look. So we have these two lineages. One is the Ixuteloids from the anamorph, the asexual stage is Ixutela. Then we have this other clade here, which is represented here in this paper. We have the hymenosteoboids or steubeloid species that relates to their asexual stage they produce. So there are a bit complicated names, but that just relate to the asexual morphology. And they are phylogenetically distinct. So that's that we can call them uh, hymenosteoboids, hymenosteoboids here, and then or exuteloids. But then we know that there are now two lineages of these fungi. And then we could then ask other questions more uh, on the evolution of them and, and the evolution of traits, for example, the behavior manipulation. I will show in the next slide. Uh, this slide shows a, a question that I often get from, 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 from people that are interested in this fungi. How many species we, we're still, uh, we still have waiting to be described? So this is, uh, the map showing the three locations that have been studied more intensively in Brazilian Amazon, Duque, Reserva Duque, Maracá, and Virua. So those are three places that we know a lot about the, the diversity of ants, because a colleague of mine, Fabrício Baccaro, 
he's a professor at the Federal University of Amazonas. He has like now now it's about 20 years of experience collecting very intensively ants in these places. So he knows the diversity of ants very well, and he helped us a lot to identify the, the ants. So and then the graph on the right side, the those names are ant genera. And the uh, gray bars means the number of species in that ant genera. So for example, Feidoli here. So it's comprised by 72 species in the Brazilian Amazon. And then if we compare with uh, Componotus, which is the carpenter ants, they are composed by 32 species here. Then the black bar means the number of those species infected by Ophiocordyceps. So remember that, uh, the, the specificity is very high. So there are 16, 17 species of, um, nowadays there are more, but when we, we did this graph here, so we found that 50% of the, the Componotus in the Amazon were infected by entomopathogenic fungi. And we know that it's more, so this is very conservative, but it's still 50% of the carpenter ants in, in the Amazon are infected. So if we extrapolate that worldwide, we have 1200 species of Componotus. And if we keep the same rate, very, very conservative rate of 50% uh, of infection in, this, in these species, we still have 570 species of Ophicordyceps yet to be described. But I honestly, I, I feel that this number could be even greater because every time I go to this forest, I find new, 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 new species. So this number is all, all, never flattened, the curve never flattens, flattens. So there's always new species that never um, stabilized. So there's always new discoveries. So I think this is an underestimation, but it's still 600 species. So this 500 is 600 minus 30 when we, we have this uh, figure made. Now it's a, a bit uh, higher. So it's maybe uh, 565 species of Ophiocordyceps yet to be described. But anyway, so there's hundreds of species to be described just on the zombie ant clade. So imagine all entomopathogens. And as I mentioned, the behavior manipulation is uh, one of the most interesting features of these fungi, which is their ability to manipulate the host behavior when they are infected. So this behavior manipulation falls very well the extended phenotype uh, term that was coined by Richard Dawkins in 1982, where he, he suggests that the, the genotype of the, the pathogen of the par fungal parasite or whatever parasite it is, so the genotype of the parasite is expressed in the, the phenotype of the host. So that's how, what uh, extended phenotype term means. So the, pheno, the genotype of the, the fungus being expressed in the phenotype of the end in, the, in the, the sense of the behavior manipulation. So back in 2019, we proposed a hypothesis on how the behavior manipulation have evolved. So again, we reconstructed the phylogeny of, uh, of your cordyceps. And then we mapped according to the host association. So this, this here, the, the two main colors you, you should pay attention is the blue, which, which is the origin, the coleoptera association, and red is the ant association. So we see that, as I showed in the, the, the previous slides, that the ancestral of the genus of Eucordyceps was retrieved as a, a beetle larvae here in the node number one. And then down there in the, the node number two, we have a host jump from beetle to the ants and on, on the bottom. So the, the lineage that went to the bottom here uh, uh, after the node number three. So we see that it was a huge radiation. So from one species unilateralis, now we have a branch with over uh, 35 species described. So that's obviously uh, uh, radiation there. So we, we wonder what has been happening here that the behavior manipulation evolved here in number three. So our, our hypothesis relates to this figure down here. So number one means that the, it's a, the niche here on the, the tree on the, on, the, on the forest floor. So here back in number one, these species infecting the, the beetle larvae, they still inhabit here, which is most likely what happened in the ancestral of your cordyceps lineage. So there was a, a fungal infecting beetle larvae in the tree trunk like the basal lineages in the Ophiocordyceps still do. We still find them in the forest. But according to our data, the ancestor was all, also infecting the beetle larvae on the forest floor 
in, in a trunk, most likely, where they, they, these beetle lay the eggs, which is also where the, the carpenter ants also inhabit. So they, they are carpenter ants. So they, they make holes and tunnels in these uh, trunks. So means that they share this niche with the beetle larvae. So there, there is a niche overlap between beetle larvae and carpenter ants. So that's a, on these uh, fallen trees in, in, the, in the forest floor. So our hypothesis suggests that the niche overlap might have played a role for the jump from the beetle larvae to the ants. However, when this uh, lineage infecting beetle jump from a beetle larvae that is uh, completely naive and it's soft body and it's not a, a colonial insect, so it's a solitary, so it doesn't have others take care of themselves. So when this uh, ancestral lineage jumped to the ants, they found something called a social immunity, which is the public health system of ants, so-called. And once this uh, lineage of fungi jumped to the ants, they found this social immunity, which means that other ants that find that one of their nest mates are infected by a fungus or another pathogen, they will quickly kill these ants or kick them out from the nest or rip them apart and throw in the, the trash chamber. So meaning that that disease, that infection would not spread inside the fortress, which is the, the ant's nest. So our hypothesis is that the social immunity play the role of forcing the fungi to develop or the social immunity selected a lineage of fungi that had the ability to remove the ant out of their colony before it the ant had recognized that last uh, nest mate as an infected. Uh, work and worker. So once the fungi jumped to the, the ants, they found the social immunity and they found a way to remove the ants from the nest and then place them in a high, uh, in a higher uh, position. So back to the, the figure there, if you see the number two, so we see that number one is the tree trunk on the, on the forest floor. And number two there is where is the tip of these palm trees or the leaves. And that, that's a summit position. And then they can shower the spores on the forest floor without being bothered by other ants trying to remove the, the fungi from that location or rip them apart. So the fungi place the ants on this underside of leaf or, or, or on the side of the leaf. And then they have time to produce the fruiting body and then the other ants will not recognize as an infected ant. So it will we stay there and the fungus will produce the fruiting body as I showed and shower spores on the ground. And when the other ants go out to forage, they will eventually step on these uh, spores that were uh, ejected from, from, from above, and then they will get infected eventually. So the social immunity uh, might have been the, the, the driving force to, uh, for the evolution of the behavior manipulation. That's the current accepted hypothesis. And this slide shows a different case. So it's also behavior manipulation, but instead of making the ants to climb to a, a summit position to a plant, it will descend. So this Dolicoderus um, monacetes, and the, it's an ant, so they nest on the canopy of the trees. And then when they get infected, they will go down and bite onto the moss. But if you look on the right side, you see that two figures, one on the top with the white arrows are the, the fungal fruiting bodies emerging from the back, from the, the head of the ant. And the, the other figure at the bottom, we see the sporophytes of the moss, which is very, very similar to the, 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 the fruiting body of the fungus. It's very similar to the sporophyte of the moss. So we're still very intrigued to understand why the fungi manipulate that host to die in that specific location. And once they produce the fruiting body, it looks strikingly similar to the sporophyte of the moss. I think there is a very, very interesting story to be told behind, behind these species. And I'm looking forward to, to figure that out. But that's one of my favorite species. And now also on the behavioral side of the story, so I'm wrapping up soon. We have this a comparison between the tropical species, Brazilian Amazon, and the temperate forests in South Carolina in this case. So in tropical forests, only in three days, the, the fungi already grow this tall and is already producing asexual spores. While in temperate forest, if you, if you see the, this, uh, this timeline at the bottom, we see day one, day 17, day 33, only in the, after the day 300, here in, in the case of the figure 325, 
the fungus will be mature and then be able to shoot spores in the environment. So that means it has to overwinter the whole year until they, they can complete their, their cycle in the next summer. So they get infected in July or June or August, and then they will only be able to shoot spores, sexual spores on, on the ground in the next year. So that's, if you notice, the one in the, uh, in the Brazilian Amazon is biting onto a leaf, while the ones in the temperate forest in South Carolina is biting onto a twig. So that fine-tuned calibration on the behavior manipulation, so the fungi makes the ant bite onto twigs in the temperate forest. So when the leaves fall down in the, on, in the fall, in the autumn season, the fungi will uh, ensure that the host will be attached to that precise location because they are very uh, um, uh, fragile and they're very sensitive to uh, environmental fluctuations. So it will remain stable there and then we can complete the life cycle in the next year. So on the, on the left side, we see that uh, there is a phylogeny, but instead of the color coded by the host association, this is color coded according to the substrate they bite. So our, uh, our data suggests that the origin of behavior manipulation was a leaf biter, and then the twig biters evolved multiple times, so at least four different times along the evolution of these fungi. And if we plot that onto a map, we see that the tropics here, they are biting very, very often uh, I, with only a single specimen I found in Ghana here, uh, where the sea down here, that were biting onto a trunk, but all the other records for the, the zombie and clade are biting onto leaves, meaning these uh, green, green dots here. And then in the, the temperate systems here in the uh, United States, Canada, here also in Japan, they bite onto twigs. There's one exception for one species I, I described in Japan of the Cordyceps satoi. They bite onto evergreen plants, so the evergreen forests, so the leaves won't fall on the ground. So for these species, it, it, it doesn't matter. So but we, we see here a pattern that tropical, uh, that temperate forests tend to uh, species of fungi make the, the host to bite onto twigs, while the ones in the tropics bite onto the leaves. So there was a, a phenotype that was shaped by the environment, was an environmental adaptation. And now we'll quickly uh, wrap up showing some other projects I'm currently working. I show that the, the zombie and fungi is comprised by a, a complex of species and we're just starting to understand their diversity. And that's very similar across basically the whole Hippocryallian uh, tree. So here are just a few examples of mycoparasites infecting uh, entomopathogens, it's a large cryptic group, gibellulas infecting spiders, or acanthomyces infecting moths, or the scale insect parasites, the hypocrella ascarsonia like fungi, or the beetle larvae of the Cordyceps melolonte. And this group that I'm, I'm working currently is the one that's very interesting because recently, they switched from a parasitic stage. And then according to our uh, preliminary data, we're still writing the paper, there are at least five different independent origins for this switch. So they switched from a, 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 micro, a, from a, a entomopathogen, and then they became beneficial endosymbionts. And we see that these cicadas here with this fruiting body, those are the, the, the classic cordyceps, off your cordyceps. Uh, parasite. So it grows the fruiting body out, out of the host, shoots spores and infect other insects and so on. But then there are also groups that they, they live inside the host as uh, yeast-like cells and they are transmitted vertically. So rather than spending a lot of energy producing the, killing the insect, overcoming their immune system, killing them, producing the fruiting body, that's very uh, cost, uh, costly to the, in, to the, the fungus, they will remain cryptic inside the, 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 the host body as yeast-like cells and they're transmitted vertically. So they will be transmitted to 100% of the offspring. So that was a very interesting uh, finding that there was, uh, were these uh, transitions. And we are working to, this, to describe the, the first lineages of that soon of uh, uh, endosymbionts. And I'm also very interested now to explore more the mycoparasites, we have a paper uh, accepted already, should be published uh, in about two weeks, I, I believe, in Personia. So we're describing two new genera of um, mycoparasites infecting entomopathogenic fungi. 
So we have the ant in this case, we have the Ophiocordyceps species. Then we have another fungal species. In this case, we found two genera infected just one species of entomopathogen. So perhaps we're just seeing the beginning of an explosion of, uh, of biodiversity discoveries on and the entomopathogens. We know very little about the entomopathogens. We know even less about the mycoparasites infecting them. So that's a very promising field of discoveries, I guess. And this group is, of course, really interesting system for outreach and to, uh, for the general public. There are lots of people interested and are, have been receiving uh, media coverage and has been uh, featuring in New York Times, National Geographic, The Mirror, and many other places. So I think that's a great uh, system to promote mycology, promote people interested in, in mycology, and to be as a mother system and inspiring to people that is willing to understand biodiversity, parasitism, evolution, many types of things. And also the uh, documentary, that's something I'm really interested to bring into my research. Uh, this is a video we, we did in back 2014, but we removed that from, from the, the, their original place. But, and then the, the fungus did not uh, grow as they were supposed to do because they're very sensitive. So we see here that they, they grow as a fuzzy, cottony, uh, strain things, very unorganized, hypo growth. So that's because they are very sensitive. And now we learn that. And then we, when we want to do this time lapse, we have to go there and don't remove it from there. So we have to make all the footages there in the forest, which make things more complicated, but then we have much better results. So those are also things I'm very interested to develop. And I would like you to thank you all for coming and watching this talk. And I hope you get uh, interested in the next talks I'm, I'm, I'm planning now. So thank you very much. I will be happy to take any questions you might have. Awesome, thank you so much. That was really great. Uh, really great um, photographs uh, in there. Um, and I know I have a couple of questions, but so if anybody has any questions, feel free, you can put them in the chat or if you wanna raise your hand, um, you can put on your microphone and you can ask the question if you would like to. Um, all right, we already got, okay. So question from Vanessa. Do you think that we could get infected as humans or I would say in any kind of mammals, do they have uh, the possibility? No. No, these fungi are st strict to arthropods. So they, as I showed, they, they infect also spiders but mostly insects. So they're adapted to infect insects only, not, not humans. Well, there's, um, there's, I don't know if few, one, I'm pretty sure there's one record, but I don't know if there's more of a Bovaria that has killed someone because it, the person was so immunocompromised that it got the, the fungal infection and, and, and died of that. But, of course, this is a very special, uh, very unique uh, case. So it's, it, we shouldn't say that this fungi can kill humans and much less they can, um, they can uh, uh, manipulate our behavior or anything like that. There are all, all, all other diseases that can do that. For example, the toxoplasma in mice and, and, and cats. So they make the, 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 the mice to uh, lose their fear of cats. So they get more easily caught by the cats so they can be transmitted to the next trophic level. That's also for fish, so for some nematodes that do that. It makes the insects jump into the water, commit suicide. And then they, it can emerge from the, the insect body and, and, and then leave their aquatic state. So these type of examples exist, but not that the cordyceps can infect uh, uh, humans. No, that's that's, not true, but it's very interesting to think about it and watch a movie or play a video game in this subject. It's quite uh, mind blowing, I guess. All right, Natalia, you have your hand up if you wanna go ahead. Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Joe, for the, for the talk, it was pretty amazing. You. Uh, you basically, you kept answering the questions that I was having. <laughs> So that was a lot of fun to, to hear. So, but, so now that you have all this information, right? So what do you think it, it is the, the most like burning question that you have about this group that you would like to answer in the future? Like 
-hmm. Yeah, the, the first one is to keep uh, exploring the biodiversity. So the diverse of these fungi, although it looks like, wow, that's a lot of data, but because I, I spend like, I'm, I'm working with these fungi since 2010, like 12 years, but this is just the tiny, tiny tip of the iceberg. Like, as I showed, we described 30 species, but there's still 570, conservatively speaking, waiting to, to be described. So I think the first thing is to keep doing taxonomic foundational work, field work, exploring, and then paving the way for other studies. So I think that's, that's the most important part. But there's also other interesting aspects. For example, these fungi can be used, especially the co-evolved ones, can be used to fight back crop pests, for example, that the, the model system has been Bovarian meteorism, but those are not co-evolved. They are generalist. They, they can affect many different types of insects, including pollinators eventually. So the, in, in, from my perspective, I don't think this is a, a good strategy. And I think we should, again, back to, to the, the foundational work, understand the species diversity and understand which species are uh, co-evolved with that particular insect group, for example, you wanna, you wanna fight. So try to use a co-evolved parasite in, the, in their center of origin. Because what makes something in the past? So just some a species that was introduced in another environment that doesn't have any antagonistic species to control their population. So they just explode and they, they, they take whole areas, whole countries and continents sometimes. And just because they don't have the co-evolved parasitic and parasites or predators or parasitoids, so they don't have any pressure. So I think we should understand the basic biology and the, how they co-evolve and which groups of fungi, in fact, which groups of insects. So this is really foundational work that has to be done. But without that, we would not be able to move on from this generalist Bovarian meteorism and start using, which from my point of view would be the, the transformative work. I think there's a lot to be, uh, to be wait, to, to wait for the fungi to, to solve because they're really amazing organisms. They can be used for uh, psychedelic medicine now that has been uh, trending and we have seen documentaries about that and all that. But the, uh, from my perspective, from my work perspective is to explore co-evolved parasites and also that they can fight not only crop pests, but they can also infect human vector diseases. For example, Aedes aegypti, the, the vector of uh, malaria, yellow fever, Zika, dengue, all, all that. So instead of using poison, like throwing poison, uh, in, in, I have seen that in Brazil, those trucks that fumigate whole, whole streets with, with smoke of, of uh, chemicals to kill the, the insect and perhaps even ourselves. So I think we should go to their center of origin and try to find a co-evolved fungal parasite and then bring them here and try to apply them. But this is a, a long-term thing. We should go there and identify the co-evolved parasite, which is uh, in Africa, in Madagascar or in Senegal. So that, those, that's a, a project I want to, to implement and we're working on that. And anyways, so there are many other ideas, but basically it goes around uh, work on co-evolved parasites to fight human disease vectors or uh, crop pests. And I guess that's why we do the, you know, all these biodiversity studies. You have to first know what there is before you can go from there. Yeah, exactly. Just yeah. The foundation yeah. for all of that. Yeah. And unfortunately, there's a, now people are super, it, this is very important, but there is an unbalance between people willing to do super high tech, cutting edge genomic work and proteomics and all these omics that uh, it's fantastic, these advances. We we're forgetting about the basic, the foundational work, like being able to go to the forest and find the organism you study. So this is this is really crucial. But we're unfortunately, I, I noticed that we're losing that ability, and people are more into the these super high tech genomic things. So I think we should combine both field biologists and high tech omics people. That's that's the way to go, I guess. But not forget the the foundational taxonomic work. I think this is crucial. Speaking of this, um, Jordan had this question that I also was wondering. So you talk about the number of undiscovered species. This is just in this Amazonian yeah. kind of region, right? So just zombie ants. That's a zombie ant clade. I, I was talking about 600 species, just the zombie ant clade. 
And so you showed that map. So that was a bunch of different groups. But I noticed for the all of the spots where there was there were no points. Was that because there that was not the scope of that that figure, or have they just not been like? Is for example in Western U.S. have there not been any observations of these kind of entomopathogenic fungi or? Oh yeah, well that figure shows only Ophiocordyceps unilateralis clade, which is the zombie ant fungi strict to sensor. So that's their, their plot. But you saw that there's just few spots. In Ghana, and more recently, I did a survey in Ethiopia. We found it there as well. But that, these fungi are everywhere in the tropics, everywhere in the tropics, in the, in the jungles and, and all that. And even in US, so I have described one species from Florida, one species from Missouri, one species from South Carolina. And I received uh, recently, I think it was Jordan that sent that to me, uh, a, a group of uh, ants that were biting onto, onto trunks so there are people sending specimens from different parts of US, including here, there are collections in the, in, at the garden, there, there were uh, the, the herbarium there, that collections from Maine, for example, and I have seen in, 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 in the Farlow herbarium in, in Harvard, there are also collections from Maine by, by Roland Taxter. And so they're, they're everywhere, it's just a matter of going there and, and try to find. So I'm collaborating with, with lots of, of people here and they are sending amazing specimens. I think I think Jordan is is one of them. I don't see his his face, but the, uh, I think I think he sent some really interesting specimens. But I I just too much work going on, and I cannot process all these species uh, as fast as as I wanted to. So having students would be would be very very useful, and we're moving towards that direction. Hopefully, we can start publishing more and more species more intensively. But they are here in the U.S. For sure, in Pennsylvania, so a colleague of mine, uh, he he collected some species in, in Pennsylvania that we still need to to look at them more carefully. But they're likely a new species. It was Rowan? Rowan sent these from Pennsylvania to me. So they are everywhere in the U.S. as well. It's a, it's a you know I guess a good and bad place to be in to have so much to do that you mm. can can you know yeah. practice all of it. Yeah, and, I, and I'm particularly more interested in the tropics because I'm Brazilian, so I grew up in the tropics and there's so much diversity there and it's so amazing to have the chance to spend time there. So I'm also interested to spend time here, as I, I mentioned, I, I think I, we were talking on, on the backstage before we started that I, I might start to co-advise a master's student in Kentucky University. And he found lots of very, very interesting species I have never seen before in Kentucky. So it's just a matter of go there and, and collect. So it's the same and here in Northeast. Is there a, okay, so like if I wanted to go try to look and find these, like what would be a good, is it once you kind of know what you're looking for, you can come across them more often or are there certain yes. kinds of? Mm -hmm. Yes, for example, gibelulas infecting spiders. I found a bunch of them, the cat skills here in, in near New York, like two hours driving from here, three hours. So I found lots of them and I went to a group of people there and they found, I, I found all those species. And we spent like one hour, two hours. I found like 10, 15 pheasants. It was a really good day for Northeast. It's not common to find so many entomopathers, but that day was good. And then they got impressed. Oh, wow, we're collecting things at this exact place for 20 years and we never found that. Just because they're tiny, they're, they're, imagine a spider, a jumping spider with some tiny mushrooms coming out of their head. So it's really, really difficult unless you're looking for them. So my advice for those who, who want to, to, to find these species, look on the underside of leaves. You have to flip leaves, thousand leaves, and then until you find something. And then other species, for example, that dies on the base of the trees, the cordyceps, sensu stricto, Isaria, cordyceps, so they usually uh, infect uh, holes in the, the, these tree trunks or the base of trees. So if you see a small white powdery thing, so if sometimes when you dig this thing, there is a pupa buried there. So it's just a matter of uh, know what you're looking for and try to explore these small niches that we usually just walk through and try to find the mushrooms. So we don't stop and dedicate like one hour for this square meter here. So we'll spend every inch of this tree and 
until I find something. And then eventually you'll find on the leaf litter and base of trees, underside of leaves, um, twigs, all sorts of places. So, but underside of the leaf is easiest to, to spot things. So there are many groups of these fungi that, that kill their hosts on the underside of leaves. So flip leaves. And the payoff will be worth it when you find them. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we also have something in here from um, Tommy asking if there's uh, any interesting defense mechanisms that the um, insects and the spiders ha have evolved uh, in response mm -hmm. to the infections. Yeah, the, well, I, I don't know too much about that, but there's some uh, literature on the uh, exploring the immune systems of the insects and or how these fungi would be fighting uh, this immune system back. So this is more into a molecular molecular level and immune system level. I, I don't think there is any, not that I am aware of, that some uh, behavior to avoid uh, entomopathogenic fungi or any morphological adaptation to, to overcome this fungi. Actually, understanding how the immune system of the insect is, is being overcome by this fungi would be really interesting to explore uh, pharmaceuticals uh, potential for this fungi, because uh, these uh, yeast-like cells are fighting an immune system. So imagine how much pharmaceutical compounds and biochemicals and chemicals and all sorts of uh, mechanism, molecular mechanisms are happening there to kill the insects, overcome their defenses, kill them, and then switch from this parasitic to be a saprophytic because they switch, once they kill the, the host, they switch from parasitic to saprophytic, and then they consume the insect body. So imagine how much molecules they are producing, how many things has been going on in the insect body that we just don't know. Maybe the, the cure of cancer is there. So how can we, inf how can we like infect one specific type of cells and, and fight that cell? Maybe it will be through understanding how entomopathogens overcome the immune system of the host. So this is really an uh, open field for exploration. And you had mentioned talking about the video, are there certain, I guess, certain species are easier than others to, to have them grow in like, out, like outside of their natural kind of habitat or are there some they will just refuse to be cultured or however you might? Well, yeah, yeah, culturing them can be tricky, but some groups are easy. For example, the ones, the zombie ants, they are not made to grow. They're not growers by, by themselves because they're the universe, the, 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 their substrate they have to, to colonize is an ant, it's an ant body. So they just form a, we call endosclerotium, which is a, a very hard a hypho mass. So that's all they, they have to grow. And then the fruiting body. So that's all they, they grow rather than a soil fungi that spread their hyphae and grow like soccer field um, and, and they're super large. So they, those are not growers. So it takes months, literally months to get a plug like this diameter of growth. So these, they're really uh, difficult to grow, some of them. Some grow much easier. The endosymbionts, only one species have been, uh, uh, so far as I know, only one species in the cicada in Japan has been cultured among many lineages that has been described. So they can be tricky as well, the, especially the end of symbiont. But just connecting to uh, infection and rate of, of, of things, I, I've shown that the list of ant genera, so some, uh, some ants are completely free of infections, like a Peidoli, I showed that 72 species in the Amazon, and there's not a single one recorded infected by this fungi while Camponotus are over 50% of their species are commonly found infected. So that's also something I want to explore in, in this next grant, I'll be exploring that. So why some insect groups are magnets for fungal infections and they act as islands of biodiversity, while other insects that live in the same area, they share the same niche, so they get totally free of fungal infections. So why, what makes some in insects immune while others are super susceptible to fungal infections. So that's a really interesting, we have some hypothesis, but then that would be getting, getting too long here. But yeah, there's so many things to talk about that. Oh, definitely. Uh, and 
we have some a couple people I were very intrigued by this moss borophyte mimic. Yeah, me too. Uh, <laughs> And I wonder, it's crazy to think about, because also, right, to think about the way that the evolution goes, it's easy to think of something, be like, oh, the, you know, there was a conscious choice to kind of do this when in fact, it's kind of this like very like large time scale kind of series of some mm -hmm. good luck or, uh, you know, different kinds of other lineages that were there in the middle. Um, so it, it's just really crazy that they end up in this. Yeah, well, we, we tend to uh, un be anthropocentric and, and think about evolution as decision making. Oh, the fungi decided to to place the ant up there. So there's no decision. It's just a lineage that evolved, and just one had the ability to manipulate the, the host behavior. The other ones were extinct because the 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 last the the nest mates of the ants recognize that one, that fungal lineage that wasn't able to remove the ant from the nest. So that lineage was, that uh, ant infected by this fungi was killed. So the fungi could not complete their life cycle. So it got extinct. But one lineage out of who knows how many were able for a mutation or for an another reason, were able to produce compounds or whatever they do. We don't, we don't actually know what, how they do that, but how, and then they were one lineage was able to remove the ant from the from the nest and place them in the summit position, and so that lineage is still here. We still see them because they 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 were able to persist in the environment, produce fruiting body, shoot spores, transmit the spores to the next host, and persist in the environment while others perished. So they they got extinct. So then we just see the the successful ones. Let's let's put it that way. So there's, it, it's hard to, to, to say that the decision making or things like that. That lineage that has the ability to make the ants to climb down to the, from the tree and then bite to that specific moss that coincidence or not produce a fruiting body that strikingly resembled the sporophyte of the moss was successful while others that didn't have this ability uh, got extinct. So I, I, I see it that way. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> okay, we have one more question here before we wrap up. Uh, Jordan was asking about the mycoparasites. Uh, oh, yeah. do, do, so are the do the mycoparasites really affect the fungi that they're and what what stage are they infecting them? And I mean, you see, you can see that. <laughs> yeah, well, lots of stages in 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 the tropics. Well, also in Florida, where I, I described uh, two new genera infecting one species of entomopathogen. Um, so they're, they're, they're quite common, but well, imagine that there are a handful of people studying diversity of zombie ants in the world. So that's myself, there's another group in Thailand, uh, and eventually one study pops here, here and there, but there are very few people dedicating to study this, this group. So we, we, we just overlook this, um, this, uh, mycoparasite. So we know very little about the fungi infecting the ants. So we know even less about the fungi infecting the fungi infecting the ants. So that's just something that there are some studies uh, popping up here and there. I'm getting very, very interested on that after we found two new genera in a single species of fungi. So that's something I, I, I would see that's uh, like a good frontier to be explored on, on uh, species description and also metabolites because this fungi has to, to kill the fungi and consume the fungi. So you ask what, what they do with them. They consume them, they kill the, the entomopathogen. And then often before killing, it castrates because it grows in the fruiting body and then they get into the, the, the paratheesia and consume the fruiting body. So the, the fungi eventually can, can remain alive but they, they won't be able to shoot spores. So it castrates the fungi. And I'm thinking about uh, some project with some colleagues in Japan, so we're using fish Fluorescence, fluorescence in situ hybridization. We can use that to, to uh, make this two different fungi to glow, glow in different colors. So we would say uh, Alphacordyceps hyphae in pink, then we would see the mycoparasites in yellow, for example. Then we would see how they are interacting and if they're producing structure and how they are penetrating the tissue. So that, those are all ideas we're, we're having now because this is just, this uh, research line is just starting. 
very right. Again, there's so many things. These yeah, yeah, high, yeah. The cutting edge technologies with the kind of basic biology, and, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much for giving this talk, for answering everybody's questions. Um, yeah. And reach and out if, if you have any questions. So my email you, is jaraujo at uh, nybg.org. So there's, uh, let me put here on the, on the chat. And please reach out if you have questions or if you find something interesting would be great to keep in touch. And uh, this, we will have the recording up on our YouTube page soon. Uh, if you want to watch this again or share with anybody. Um, and the next talk that we'll have later on in the month is uh, going to be going in even smaller kind of uh, state of being. We're going to be talking about the virome on mm -hmm. pollen. So what, what the pollen grains are carrying themselves on them. So that will also be really cool. Uh, so yeah, thanks everyone for coming. There is a fungus that in fact and that in fact bees that they mimic pollen grains, Ascosfera, yeah. if you are interested. Just nice. a note. <laughs> nice. All right. Have a great night, All everybody. Right. Bye. Thank you.